I used to say when I'm the last presenter at a conference, I used to say that I hate to be the one before you and a beer or wine. But I guess the cool thing is about virtual conferences is that you can actually have wine while you listen to my talk. And it's probably going to make it actually more interesting. Um, so uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Charlie. Um, like a very quick overview of um, uh, who I am and what we do at Coveo, uh, since I guess you all have Google, so you can actually you know, search that <laughs> yourself with more time, since we have a lot of interesting things to say today. Um, so I used to be the founder of a startup in Silicon Valley, Tuzo. These are the three founders. I'm obviously the more handsome one and the funnier one. Uh, Tuzo was recently acquired last year by North American Unicorn Coveo. Um, to basically further enhance the AI and NLP capabilities of the company. Uh, for those of you who uh, do not know uh Coveo is a like AI-powered search recommendation um, engine uh, with um, 500 employees, uh, approximately 1,000 customer deployments. Uh, Coveo raised a total of more than $300 million in the last couple of years. Uh, in particular, last year, Coveo raised $200 million to achieve the price status of Unicorn. Um, and again, like six months, like no more than six months ago, like nine months ago now, um, they acquired my own startup and I've been the lead AI scientist of Coveo uh, thus far. Um, before uh, diving deep into the material of today, let's let's get into, into credits. This is one of my favorite quotes. So if you steal from one of those platforms, if you steal from many it's research, it's a bunch of people we really want to thank. Um, so Christine, Luca, Ciro, and Federico. Federico is a uh, um, postdoc fellow at Bocconi University in Italy. Um, Christine, Luca, and Shiro are my colleagues at Coveo. And this work is a joint work with them. So nothing that you will see today would be impossible without their help. And of course, it's, you know, it's, it's customary to say in this occasion, if there's any mistake or any errors in this talk, um, I'm sure it's their fault and not mine. So today we're gonna discuss of a very, very, very important use cases in commerce. Uh, this is to um, um, uh, to user to shoppers that goes into into um, into any commerce shop. One is Bob and the other is in hand. Bob is a basketball fan, so he browses for some basketball product and then he starts typing something in the search bar N. And then we want ideally the e-commerce shop to actually recognize his intent and provide very relevant things like Nike LeBron shoes or NBA jersey or something like that. Anne is a tennis fan. She's a tennis fan, so Anne really likes tennis, she's browsing for tennis rackets and then a tennis skirts. And so when she types N in the same sport apparel shop, we wanted the shop to recognize that and propose something like Nadal racket or Nike women's shoes or so on and so forth. Bob and End need not to be necessarily logged in. And Bob and End needs, you know, they may be the first time that they actually go into this website. So what we're gonna discuss today is how we're gonna build this type of experience using the latest tools from deep learning and our research um, lab. Some fact about e-commerce for those of you that, I mean, like know a lot about search, um, but maybe not about the industry space. So real website, by real website, I mean, you know, not Amazon, not eBay, not Zalando, like, you know, the vast majority of website you are actually gonna browse on have two big problems. One is high bounce rate, which means that as when user goes on a website, after a few interaction, they typically get out of it. So, um, so it's very hard to keep using on your website. The second one is that the, the user base is very small. Um, which means that most of the people actually come back to the website two or three times in an entire year. These two facts combine for two important generalizations that we need to keep in mind when we discuss personalization in commerce. First one is personalization needs to happen as early as possible in the journey and with as little user data as possible. As early as possible, because if you don't provide a personalized experience, people will leave. Little user data as possible because, as we discussed, very few users will actually come back two or three more times. So the actual amount of data you have about a single user it's very very small. Um, which you know all these things together imply that every personalization solution out there that relies on user history are basically not covering the vast majority of users. So they're useful for you know the small portion of user that comes back, but the vast majority of user will still not be uh, basically benefiting from anything like that. So um, the other fact that I want to convey about e-commerce is that session information is rich. So when people go on a website, even if they're not really logged in, what they do typically follow an intent or a trend. So this is like a sample from a real session of, of one of our customer 
This is Anne again. She's, she's browsing for guest t-shirt. She's actually then searching for a guest t-shirt. She click on another t-shirt. And now if you ask what is she going to buy, what is the most likely item she's going to buy? She's going to buy one, she's going to buy two, or she's going to buy three. The answer that most people give to this question is obviously one, which is actually what happened in practice in the session that actually took place on the shop. Uh, how do we know that as humans is that we kind of clearly recognize the intent, which is buying a, like a, like a t-shirt for women. Uh, and we also recognize in this case, brand awareness. Like, you know, she only browsed things for guests and she explicitly used language guest t-shirt to actually single out um, uh, those products. In fact, if you take, so this is the top searches that are issued in a real sports apparel um, shop from different sections of the website. And as you see, the linguistic behavior of the users changes drastically depending on the session of the website you're in. Again, in somehow reinforcing the idea that what happens within a session or what happens basically in real time is very, very relevant to provide uh, personalized NLP capabilities. So now that the problem is clear, we need to answer two questions. So how we can, to answer the questions, like how can we teach sessions to machines? So how we can give machine the same kind of understanding of what the intent is in a session. And then once you do that, how we can use this information. So the, the way in which we understand intent to personalize language behavior. We're gonna do, you know, we're gonna tackle these two questions in turn. The first thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna build a vector space using deep learning. Uh, we're gonna exploit a technique known as word to vec which many of you will be familiar um, with that. Uh, uh, Trey Granger discussed briefly about that like two talks ago. Uh, so we're not gonna spend so much time in it. But the general idea is that you can build um, a dense space of words uh, by exploiting the fact that similar words appear together in a similar context, right? Uh, we're gonna do the same, but we're gonna do the same with products because that's what people interacted with when they actually browse your website. Um, the intuition is the same, like similar products appear in similar browsing context. It's kind of the uh, machine learning counterpart to the saying of you can, you know, you know a lot of a man uh, by the company keeps, right? This is the kind of same thing. Like you know a lot about a product, you can learn a lot about a product by the company keeps in people's session. So if you think of typical word to vec training, you will have something like, you know, token in a session, the cat is on the mat. Um, and this token are passed to this algorithm that basically is going to build dense representation of all these tokens, like the cat is on. What we're doing with prot to vec is we're going to feed the same algorithm. It's called ski gram. We're going to feed the same algorithm. We're going to feed products in a session. So for example, this is a ski team session, and we're going to feed this product to the algorithm. What happens, and this is a real vector space, what happens when you do this in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, with, with real session data from you know, hundreds of thousands of users is that you come up with a space where products are located depending on um, uh, basically their latent properties. So similar properties will be closer in the space. If we understand a uh, product as a space, now we have a way of representing user session as basically walk or path into that space. So similar sneakers will be in similar part of the, of the, of the space. And if you imagine like representing a session of, uh, of a shopper um, that's looking for different pair of sneakers, what, what you're actually seeing, it's someone in being in one part of the space as opposed to the other. So what, as humans, we understand is your activity team or your interests or what people in commerce typically say intent is represented for machines as portion of this space. Again, there's a clear analogy here. You can tell a lot about people's preferences if they say to you that they're going on vacation on Honolulu or if they're going on vacation in uh, uh, Maine. Um, in the same way, you can understand a lot about a person if you know where the person is in this um, in this abstract space. So the way in which we represent session is basically we, every time the user is interacting with a product on your website, we're gonna capture that interaction and we're gonna place these users in the part of the space when that product is. The more product you see, the more basically we move the centroid around. And so that is gonna be our representation of your session. The cool thing about this method is that it can be built in a completely unsupervised way, right? So as long as you have a way to track um, user interaction, you can fit this to a prop to back model uh, and get automatically this space with no human intervention. So all of this can be done at scale across many clients. 
Now, the second question is, how do we personalize the language? Remember that we want to provide Bob and Anne with different language suggestions. How do we personalize the language based on, this, based on this information? The answer to this is what is called conditional language model. Uh, so a language model, generally, you, you, may, you, may, you, may, you may probably know this, uh, it's just a probabilistic model that would assign to any e-commerce a probability for any query. For example, if, you're, if your shop is selling sport apparel, the language model for your shop would tend to say that the probability of the word shoes in a query is much higher than the probability of the word iPhone, right? Because your query, your shop is all about sport. On the other hand, um, if, you're, if you're dealing with an electronic shop, your language model will probably tell you that the probability of iPhone is way bigger than the probability of shoes, just because you know that's that's what basically people are searching and buy on your on your shoes, on your shop. Um, a conditional language model goes one step further. So now we don't have just a model that assigns probability to query. We have a model that assigns probability to query, taking into account the context. So taking into account the fact that, for example, you were browsing basketball sections or you were browsing the tennis section. We're going to do that with a general architecture in deep learning, which is called the encoder-decoder architecture. The idea here is that you have basically two neural networks. One neural network which takes, um, uh, which has the task of encoding um, in a in a in a latent space the information about the session. As we saw, information about the session is captured for us using Proctovac, so using the product space that we generated. And then the encoded session is fed to a decoder network, which is another network that has the the the, uh, the job of starting from that latent um, uh, state. Uh, basically generate the language that we want. In our case, again, the first part is gonna is gonna is gonna be provided by Prof to Vect, so our Skipgram model, and the second part is provided by a type of neural, a recurrent neural network which is known as LSTM, which is the perfect neural network uh, in case you want to deal with uh, with language and um, you know generating sequence of things. In our case, generating sequence of characters. So the, the answer to our second question, which is how can you use session to personalize languages? Well. We take the encoder-decoder model from the deep learning literature and we use it as our conditional language model. So in this case, language probabilities, so the probability of Nike LeBron shoes versus Nadal racket will depend both on linguistic information, that is how much Nadal and, and, and Nike are query that are popular in the e-commerce and session data, which is you know, based on the fact that you know, Anne and Bob um, this very different part of the product space, so probably they would expect the behavior of the search part to reflect those real-time intent. So does it work? Well, the too long did the answer is yes, uh, and we extensively test this uh, uh, this research idea against uh, you know some um, uh, industry and research baseline. Um, not gonna spend like an awful amount of time on. Uh, um, on these numbers as there's like the presentation has all the links to the the actual research papers and the things we publish in open source code uh, as i think you know it's 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 more interesting if we discuss the, the general vibe instead of the numbers but what you can see here so we basically test our method which is called vec to sequence um with different lengths um on the on the suggestion bar so zero is when nothing has been typed so it's when the user just click on the search bar and you have to basically infer everything SL equals one is that when the user type one character, SL equals two is when the user actually um, type two characters. We benchmark this against popularity, which is what most people are doing in the industry. I think it's a fair assessment. So basically we're ranking queries, suggestion based on you know, how popular they are. And we try different way in which we can use dense vectors to personalize experience. One is called image to sequence, uh, which instead of using the deep product space that we, we explain, is using the images of the product catalog. So the idea here is that when the user interact with some product in a session, you extract with a convolutional neural network deep features from that image, from the image of the product, and use that in your encoder. But the cool thing about the encoder, the encoder architecture is that they're very general. So you can swap in and swap out different encoding and basically with basically no changes to the underlying code, you can train many different models. Uh, search to prot to vec is a, is, a, is, a, is a different alternative to the full encoder, the code ranking still based on, 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 on deep vectors. But it's just slightly, slightly, slightly different flavor, and vector sequence is our model, which, as you see, outperform all the other models by a significant margin. Uh, in particular, with the empty query, is 10x, like so it's 10 times better 
uh, in MRR than the um, than the typical uh, frequency based model, uh, and it's still more you know more than twice as much uh, accurate with one character queries. If you want to see uh, like a real example of what would happen um, and uh, with the model, so these are the products. These are like four session. The product is an image of the product that has been interacted with with the user. The seed is the letter that has been typed. And then we have this, the distinguishing between popularity and the encoder decoder uh, model that we propose. These query untranslated, so they are originally from a different language. That's that's why sometimes you know the seed and the and the uh, and the and the string doesn't really match. Uh, but it gives you like a good flavor of how well the model capture underlying intention. Like if you take for example the second row, you have a tennis racket. The seed is R. And obviously, the popularity model. I mean, you know, tennis is popular in, uh, in in Italy, but not so much. So uh, the, the, there are things that are way more popular, and so the model will suggest, you know, uh, Reebok CrossFit. But the model that we built actually is able to capture the intent, the tennis intent, and actually propose tennis racket as the best um, as the best suggestion. And, and and you see the other the other example as well. I think it's it's very um, it's very easy to get um, why the model is qualitatively uh, way better than um, a pure uh, frequency based model so now that we now that we know how we capture session intent so we don't assume anything about the user except the interaction within the current session and now that we know how to generate a uh, language model uh, probability based on that we're gonna take this one step further so since it's very 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 hard to get user coming back to your shop, the question is, what if, con what if the context is from a different shop? So now we discussed, you know, we discussed that it's, it's very important to, um, to be able to personalize the, uh, the, the experience of the user with as little data as possible from one website. Now we're going to take this to extreme and we're going we're gonna to try and personalize Bob experience when Bob is browsing a basketball product on, um, on uh, uh, shop number one, then he leaves shop number one, he goes on shop number two, and the first thing he does is press N on shop number two. So the question is, shop number two never saw Bob before. Shop number two may or may not be affiliated with shop number one. We're going to discuss that later. Uh, and the question is, can we actually personalize Bob experience with zero, literally zero data point on shop number two? To see how that is even theoretically possible, it may be good to like you know explore a sample of the product space for two shops in the uh, sport apparel business. Uh, as you can see here, the shops obviously are different. The space is gonna be different for the prop. You know they, they have different catalogs and you know different different interaction may have very different traffic, but there are some analogy in how things are actually in the space. Uh, in the in the case uh, in the in the sample case, you you can see that snowboards. And, and a soccer ball are kind of in the same position in shop one and shop two if you flip the space with a transformation. This thing should remind you of NLP literature where people actually had the same observation about word to vec Remember the word vector we discussed? Well, let's imagine that instead of having shops, you have languages. So now you have English and you have Spanish. And the idea is that you will train your vectors and then you project your vectors into, into a space. What you find out, I think this is this is pretty cool, is that English and Spanish you can immediately draw like some sort of analogy of what four is in one side and four is in the other. So the idea is that if these things are not exactly the same, but somehow they're topologically similar, maybe there's a way to go from one into the other. You can actually exploit this you know analogy even further if you know how you know neural translation model actually work. Uh, into these days. So uh, if you go on Google Translate and you and you say mi, mi piacciono i cani means I like dogs in uh, in Italian and you want that to be translated in French, what happens, simplifying a bit, is again another sort of encoding and decoding. So behind the scene there are two neural networks, one which is taking the English or the Italian or whatever whatever language you want, is encoding into a Latin space and then there's a neural network that decodes it in the target space. So what we did again, following the analogy with the NLP word, is that we're treating shops as languages. So what we train a deep neural model to do, we train a model to basically translate from products in one space to product into another space. 
in the same sense that you can train a language model that you can actually that you can actually um, translate between French and English or English and Germany. So the results um, are, 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 are very good. Uh, again, we call it zero shot inference because in shop two you have no information about Bob. So the only things you can do is that you can move the intent that you learn on shop one using Protovac, you translate it using a neuron translation model, and then you use that to condition your, your probability. As you can see, like three different, we, we benchmark three different models. One is the non-personalized, which is what basically everybody's doing at the moment. So if the shopper is new to this website, we're gonna count it as new. So there's no personalization involved. Well, it's, there's an unsupervised version in which you, it's a bit complex, but in which you use basically the images in two catalog to build some sort of guide for the alignment of these two vector space and the supervised translation that we just uh, discussed a bit more. As you can see, obviously the, the proposed model vastly outperforms um, the non-personalized baseline and even the unsupervised version. So the version in which you don't have any data when a user goes from one shop to the other. So the version is, is completely unsupervised is still better than the, um, the non-personalization. So as for the conclusion and next step, and then I think we have a bit of time to discuss um, the details and you know, like the use cases. Um, well, this whole idea of personalizing things with intent it's very scalable as it can build, you know, it can be built in a completely unsupervised fashion and it can build in a very scalable fashion even for very big, for very big e-commerce and can be used to inject personalization in all deep architecture that you want. Let's take another case of type I had. Now we're not trying to predict the word itself like N and Nike, but we're trying to suggest the category to narrow down your result. I mean, if you go on most e-commerce, like, you know, Amazon, eBay and so on, once you start typing, sometimes the e-commerce will nudge you in selecting a specific category, a specific facet in which you execute the search, right? Would it be nice if that category will all, would also be um, completely personalized depending on what you're doing? And you can basically use the same idea of, you know, Protovac, encoder decoding, and so on and so forth. You can basically apply the same idea to provide people with personalized category suggestion, not just suggestion itself. Um, if you want, we recently share like open source code and a paper to actually get you started with this problem. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, as I understand, we cover a lot of things and we, obviously we have to skip over a lot of technical details. Um, you can obviously download our papers uh, and, and, and research work. Um, we presented you know, this work with, um, at, the, at the web conference in Taipei. We're gonna present part of this work at ACL. Um, in July, I mean virtually in July, um, and the work is public and often we also share uh, code and implementation. Um, if you want to take part in our experiments or work with us on specific things, uh, please get in touch. We already have like live collaboration with uh, world-class institutions like Microsoft Research, um, uh, Bocconi University, and researchers from all around the world that join us um, to improve the state of the art of NLP and AI in commerce and search in general. Uh, if you prefer something a bit lighter than full research paper, we also try uh, to blog and popularize and evangelize the field uh, in a more <laughs> with, with, with a more gentle touch. Uh, so please um, go on our website and you will find uh, um, like high level description of all these use cases with a more of a let's say industry angle than just the pure scientific angle. Um, Obviously, we touch only like a like a tiny portion of what is the what is the possibilities of personalization in commerce. Uh, but hopefully, we, we 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 got the impression of the amount of information that it's hidden in a session, and how many cool things we can do if we find a way to unlock them. Uh, I always like to 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 finish my talks with the with a quote from Alan Turing, to we <laughs> to whom we basically owe everything. And that we can always see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Um, as I always say, let's not forget, uh, it's up to us to get it done. Uh, thanks so much for, for listening to this. Fantastic, thank you there, Jacopo. Um, we've got uh, certainly got some questions in the channel for you. So um, I'll start off with uh, a question from Matteo. 
Uh, what's the strategy to apply this approach to e-commerce sites that are new or that haven't properly collected user interactions in the past? Uh, yeah, very, very good question. So f for the within shop case, I would suggest to uh, start with the image version that we that we briefly discuss and that is discussed at length in the paper. The idea is that you can jumpstart instead of waiting to you to, for you to collect enough interaction to train a proper product model, which may take a couple of months uh, or even more depending on the traffic. If you can just collect like you know interactions and use the images in the catalog, which never changes and they're available at day one, you can try and use that to basically build a personalization strategy. As for the same question, cross shop, that really depends. Like the best thing is that like some of the biggest retailers in the world are multi-group brand, Gap, VF, Nike, and so on. So ideally, they probably have historical data on what people do when they move from one brand to the other. And in that case, you can use the supervised translation method that I explained. But there's another method, which is what we call unsupervised, which doesn't rely on any cross-tracking. So as long as we have data from shop one and data from shop B, let's say Banana Republic and Gap, as, as long as you have those data separately, you can use the, the, the method we propose to align the space, and then you can do basically zero shot inference. Okay, thank you. So uh, our next question is from uh, Jim Walker, who says you had a slide referencing an industry baseline you were able to exceed by 10 times. Can you clarify what that benchmark is? Uh, yeah, so the, I mean, by, in, by industry baseline, I mean, it's a noisy channel models when, like, when the, when the, when the, when the language model is estimated as a pure language model, so not conditional model, and is estimated purely from empirical frequencies. Uh, yeah, so that, that will be, will be, I, I mean, I would say as a, as a reasonable approximation of like non sophisticated approach in the industry. But also the one that is clearly more common, as all the other baseline are deep learning based, which are way more sophisticated. In fact, they're more accurate than, than this simple heuristic. But then if you actually go and see what retailers are doing nowadays, the number of retailers that will actually have already deep learning in place would be like a like a like an incredible minority. So when I say industry, I understand it's a generalization, but I think it's I mean at least it's grounded in my experience in the in the retail business. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim, I hope that answers your question. Um, Andreas Wagner uh, asks, how do you handle the cold start problem for new words, phrases, new brands, new product names? The, so there are two things you can do. So one, one, so everything we do in the, um, in the, NL, in the type ad space is based on what it's normally known as the retrieve and re-rank kind of idea. So you have a very fast model that retrieves first a bunch of suggestion and then use deep learning of very sophisticated stuff to re-rank things. Um, so since you cannot really suggest things that didn't appear before, if there's not a probability there, that doesn't really that doesn't really happen on the linguistic side. So the cold start problem for the linguistic side is not really a problem. For products, it's more interesting. We have a public we have another like publication in 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 machine learning conference coming up. And the idea is that you do two things. First, you train a product to vec model based on all the interaction of your website. Then you discard the vectors that has been generated for rare SKUs, or of course, new SKU won't even be there, but then use another model to basically fake or infer the position of these new or rare vectors into the space. So for that, we have a, we have a longer, we have a longer <laughs> another talk, another paper to uh, to present, but I'll be super happy to share you. I mean, if, if you reach out to me like privately, I, I, I can share the, the draft uh, of the work. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Dima asks uh, if you conducted online evaluation in addition to offline evaluation. For this one, not, not now. So we did online evaluation for the. I don't know if you still see my screen. Do you see my screen? No. No. Uh, okay. Okay. But yeah. So at some okay. at the, at some point, yeah, the screen's visible now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So at a certain point, like I, I mentioned the fact that you can use the same kind of architecture with some twisties, obviously. But you can use that to personalize the uh, the category in type ahead. Uh, for that, we did some online testing um, and 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 improve like statistically significant uplift. Of course, the magnitude of the uplift will heavily depend on how good the system was in the first place. So if we're always testing against ourselves, which we are already using, which we're already using good models, 
the uplift is marginal, but if you think of applying that to a standard non-personalized baseline, the uplift will be, of course, much bigger. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Martin asks, how would you detect or handle a change of user intent, i.e. I. searching for two related items in the same session, like a, a shirt and a pair of trousers? That, that, that's a very good question. So what happens when you look, I mean, at least when you look at, at, the, at a typical customer like mid-sized customers, say people making, I don't know, you know, between between twenty-five and hundred million dollars online revenues. Uh, so Alex are ranking between ten thousand and hundred thousand, just to give you like a frame of reference. So bid to mid e-commerce. Um, what we find out, at least in the verticals that we know very well, is that change of intent for people is not as frequent as you may as you may imagine. So when people go on a website, like a lot of time, they tend to be uh, in the sport upper business, for example, they tend to be mono activity. That's not always true though. So, and what, what happened there, you can do a bunch of things. You can either take, instead of taking, imagine imagine following this person in the product space, right? Now, basically what you're saying, changing of intent, meaning that you go from one part of the product space and you suddenly go to another part. So what you can do when you build this test representation, you can either discard all that information. So you can, for example, weight the vectors, you know, by recency, like, you know, like exponential discounting, you know, uh, older, uh, older product you interacted with. So the session will very much react to the latest thing you're doing. So that's one option. The other option, again, because encoder decoder is so flexible, is that you can replace the encoder we propose, which is the centroid of all the products you interacted with, and you can actually use an LSTM there as well. You can basically do sequence ins and sequence out. So now the model will be able to condition its behavior based on the entire sequence of product that you that you fit in. We add benchmarks on that, but the truth is, is that it's marginally, in our cases, it was marginally better than the average account with a way big, like, you know, way, way more sophistication and complexity in training and deploying. So we dropped that. But in theory, if you have enough data and your use case support it, it's a simple change in the encoder part. Okay, okay. Uh, there's one final question here, another one from Dina, um, who says, do you think the encoder decoder network will work for other inputs like documents? For inputs, as in we can encode documents you interacted with, and and then you you generate language. Yes, the problem with documents is that their representation historically is less straightforward than with either images, which is you know CNN, and that's basically done, or prod pro vectors, which is again like prod to vectors. Now, I I would say it's a it's a fairly stable it's a fairly stable technology we use. But yes, if you have short documents. You know, collection of sentences or so on, and you want to use like the latest encoded method, let's say sentence bird, just to make up like a practical example, you can probably do the same. Like if you have user interact with documents, you encode the documents the user interact with, with sentence bird, and then you feed that as your encoder, and then you should be able to get realistic type eyed completion uh, based on the on the on the quality on the semantic of these documents. But the the overall quality of what we did it's heavily dependent on the quality of the representation of the intent, which in our case, pro to vec work exceedingly well. Uh, and we had extensive tests before going down that road. So we, we, we made sure first that pro to vec really capture what, what you know, the latent dimensions of products in, in commerce. And then we went down the road. If you can get the same level of assurance in document space for your use cases, there's no reason to think that it, that it won't work. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Jacopo. I think we're done with our questions. Um, Thanks to you. So, um, I'm going to bring this to a close. Thank you very much for your talk. Thanks so much, guys. Um,